uh, of not only one of purified substances, high-tech machines, but also, also of more ethereal, yet equally durable things like numbers and information. These have material aspects, uh, but the instruments are attended by uh, theorizations, by discourses, and by social practices. The science, is, uh, somehow, science, however, has somehow come to stand for a world of facts, a simplified and often timeless world that pretends to speak for itself, grounded, so they say, in rationality rather than history. But knowledge with little acknowledgement of the knower. Science makes a refashion as not just material objects, but uh, people, the two. And one of the most important object or products of the activity of science is the scientist. Uh, it can, I say it, it could be God or something, fashions people as scientists and non-scientists, and rarely acknowledges human depth in either. Science is given to us as technical knowledge, to which the public should assent. Saying uh, technical means it is not the public's business, and implies also that it can be trusted because it stands apart from the ordinary domain of human interests. <coughs> Let us calculate the statistical test. A uh, statistical test of significance can settle matters. <clears throat> Otto Neurath uh, uh, once said, physicalism knows no depth. Everything is on the surface. Now, but, but can the thickness and depth of tradition, of innovation, really be dead? That was science able to drink up the sea. The tradition of social theory, uh, personified by Edmund Burke, has criticized uh, rationalism as a kind of superficiality. <clears throat> the age of chivalry is gone, he said. That of sophisters, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. <laughs> Burke preferred the continuity of tradition and of leaders and thinkers raised up within its embrace. But Marxists tried to draw attention to the contradictions that call out for radical change. And the you know, contradictions, you know, beneath the surface calling out for radical change and that are tending, as they pretend, to bring it about. But science has come to stand, at least in its public face, for evidence of a self-evident sort, uh, produced impersonally and susceptible of application in a routine way. One of its key roles is the production and implementation of standards, tools of the flattened world, which, in the day of their ideal perfection, will annihilate depth and meaning as so much sophistry. Science yearns to abdicate as long as the information. But I admit that historians are often on the other uh, uh, extreme of this, applauding the complex whenever it raises its unruly head, and that this is not a sufficient solution. But perhaps we can agree that while information usefully informs the understanding, it does not by itself ascend to the level of understanding. Also, and this is our business, that the making of information itself is fascinatingly complex, involving conceptualization and planning, skills as well as routine labor, and often a lot of compromises and conflict resolution. Often black boxes of information are forced back open. My own research is focused on the history of information entities, as well as procedures licensed for the production of thoughtless objectivity. I find it fascinating how those uh, mindless procedures are exploited by enterprising souls who are able to capture the form while circumventing the purpose of an objectified procedure uh, uh, thus making a contrived thinness a path to personal advantage. Insisting on, and these, uh, ex this exploitation of the thinness is one of the things which, uh, which takes it apart again uh, and uh, re you know, reintroduces the depth or re reintroduces the need for, uh, for depth. Insisting on the depth and complexity as well as the social character of the processes that give us scientific knowledge is no attack on science. It may even be needed to save science. And I like to hope that critical historical investigation can serve rather than undermine the ideal of reason, debate, and understanding. Well, I'm one of a number of historians here, but Sheila asked me to speak for the history of science, which uh, she includes within a capacious SDS, but I'm happy with that. I've, in fact, always taught in history departments and have wanted my work to be appreciated as a proper and worthwhile contribution to history. Meanwhile, I've moved for most of my career in the larger world of science studies, uh, by a larger world, I mean one not limited to those who strongly identify with SDS as a disciplinary home. I do not think of history and SDS as though in, in, in this world, you know, we are all happily at home in SDS. I do not think of history and SDS as rival claimants for my loyalty, 
but if SDS is the far flung community of scholars taking seriously that when much of academia still does not, the fascinating and urgent importance of uh, science and technology in regard to practically every aspect of modern life. That characterization, I suppose, applies also to, to, to almost everyone here. And I hope most will recognize history as naming an ideal of analysis in time and a whole field of exemplars for understanding scientific activity in relation to a heterogeneous culture. Uh, a culture for which science does not stand apart, but in which it moves and speaks. The historical form is no alternative to the mission of SDS, but rather can serve it while drawing on it. And the studying the past, like travel, helps us appreciate the singularity of the present, an experience that is further enhanced when we examine how the present has incorporated and been given form by all those materials, customs, ideas, and practices that the past supplied. I will say finally uh, that I think it important to be able to talk about science and languages different uh, from those of science. While this includes some terms of art of our own, you can't uh, do without them, I, pre I prefer to keep as close as my meanings allow to the vernacular. Uh, this language of study and analysis does not disavow, but includes meanings and intentions, unexpected consequences, elements of paradox. Formal tools like statistical regression or actor network analysis might be helpful, but an SDS aiming to understand S and T in relation to society, the culture, history, or politics can only go so far with these. The language is a self-conscious social science. Tools that limit or conceal interpretive judgments are suited to official use, but SDS matters also, and mainly, for citizens. Writing for the public, if we, if we grant it the, the courtesy of supposing it intelligent, distorts our analysis less than writing to supply fodder for the millstones of bureaucracy. welcoming you to Cambridge. This is a uh, truly amazing group that she's gathered together, and it's an honor for those of us here at Harvard uh, to host all of you. We've lined up, as you can see, kind of a view of the river and some rough approximation of spring weather, which is pretty hard to come by around here. Uh, I also want to personally thank both Sheila and Ted, in fact. Uh, uh, Sheila deserves two thank yous. Uh, first, as Ted said, for viewing the field of STS in a manner that's sufficiently broad to include me. Uh, a mere intellectual historian by training. Uh, and second, for actually putting her money where her mouth is by uh, inviting me to pontificate on the meaning of SDS even before the rest of you have your say. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to have been assigned this task of reflecting on Ted's talk because I owe him a much older debt, although he actually doesn't know it. Uh, like many of those on the boundaries uh, of STS, I'm basically self-educated in the field. And uh, back in my graduate days, Ted's Trust in Numbers was one of the first pieces of SDS scholarship that I ever read. And it was certainly the first one that I uh, actually understood and assimilated into my own way of thinking. So at that point, I was developing a dissertation project on science and American politics in the 20th century. And I was frustrated by the extremely simplistic political readings of epistemological claims that I was finding in most of the studies. Uh, by historians, but I wasn't sure how to go about formulating an alternative. Uh, and Ted's book gave me a, a kind of new space of interpretive freedom, uh, a vantage point from which I could question these other accounts that I had read and think anew about the ties between science, epistemology, and politics. So I just want to thank Ted for uh, liberating me from the parochialisms of American history. Um, I am, though, employed as an intellectual historian, and so I want to suggest a couple of parallels and some emerging connections between that field and this nexus of STS and history of science that Ted discussed. So let me start with the parallels. Uh, the standing of intellectual historians within the wider discipline of history is actually uh, fairly similar to that of STS scholars <coughs> who uh, work in history of science. Of course, uh, history is a pretty decentralized field, with various geographical, chronological, and methodological precincts 
that uh, fortunately relate on terms of mutual indifference rather than active hostility. <laughs> uh, but a, a strongly empiricist bent tends to unite most of those subfields, and the conspicuous exception is intellectual history. We spent uh, comparatively little time in dusty archives, uh, which inclines some of our fellow historians to think we're not actually doing research at all. Um, also, like STS scholars, we consider our field a kind of intellectual commons, uh, a space for thinking in broad interdisciplinary terms about the content, forms, production, and circulation of knowledge. So here, too, this is a space in which we mingle with scholars from many other disciplines, uh, who share our theoretical concerns and our objects of study. Uh, in fact, many intellectual historians receive most or all of their training in fields like literature, philosophy, political theory, and many of those practicing intellectual history are actually based in other disciplines. So uh, in addition to the fields I just mentioned, important historical work is done by scholars in the social sciences, especially sociology, psychology, political science, anthropology, even economics. Uh, but this outward-facing orientation <clears throat> that we intellectual historians adopt can also isolate us within our own discipline, uh, as it can for STS scholars in some history of science departments. Uh, in my case, for example, I'm likely to have as many concerns and as much vocabulary in common with a political theorist or a theoretically inclined sociologist as with a social or economic historian of the 20th century United States, uh, let alone a medievalist or a Byzantinist. Uh, in fact, I'm likely to have as much in common with someone doing ethnographic research among Russian nuclear engineers. So there's something distinctive about this task of contextualizing knowledge production that unites intellectual historians, but also tends to separate us from our disciplinary peers. And to, the, to my mind, uh, that shared task also unites intellectual historians with historians of science and STS scholars. So let me turn to those points of connection, which are uh, still mostly latent for the modern period, uh, especially, but which some intellectual historians have uh, begun to develop in earnest. There is, I think, a small but growing borderland between these three fields that holds enormous promise in terms of explanatory uh, power and scope. Now, how can this be so? At first glance, it might seem that intellectual history uh, plays a very simple and sort of negative role in relation to SDS that it would be uh, simply the repository and champion of the intellectualism uh, that STS scholars have worked to kill and bury during the past few decades. So in this reading, intellectual history is just what happens when the dreaded philosophers, this sort of common enemy, uh, decide to poke around in the archives and read some old books. And in some respects, that image is not entirely wrong. There are certainly intellectual historians who consider themselves in the final accounting philosophers and who deplore the introduction of social, cultural, and political considerations. So in their minds, uh, intellectual history is uh, a means for defending the autonomy of formal ideas from those kinds of corrupting influences. <coughs> but fields change, and the people in them change, uh, even as labels and departmental structures persist. So uh, if the phrase intellectual history sounds about as exciting enough to date as Karl Popper's demarcationism, I would suggest that it deserves another look. Context has become the key word among many practitioners in the field, especially the younger ones, uh, and above all, uh, among historians of American academic thought. There's much less talk these days about uh, ideas as actors in history, much more about how the actors in history make and use ideas, frames, concepts, discourses. And as we've worked to integrate the social and cultural matrices for knowledge production into our narratives, many of us have come upon the fertile interpretive resources of STS. We're beginning to use conceptual tools developed by STS scholars to answer questions that have arisen organically in our own studies of modern knowledge and its makers. So we are some of the people to whom STS matters. One quick point of entry into that work, I want to recommend an article by Joel Isaac, who's a, a Cambridge-trained scholar who teaches American history at Queen Mary, London. This piece is called Tangled Loops, Theory, History, and the Human Sciences in Modern America, and it was published in 2009 in the journal Modern Intellectual History. Just to give you a sense of the scope, the footnotes there run from Quentin, uh, Quentin Skinner and Dorothy Ross on the intellectual history side to the likes of Peter Gallison, Trevor Pinch, Steve Shapin, Bruno Latour, Donald McKenzie, and Ian Hacking, from whom Joel takes his title. It's, I think, a, 
a virtuosic piece of work, and it nicely captures uh, these emerging lines of connection between intellectual history, history of science, and STS. Uh, also fascinating, I think, is the contrast between Joel's writings and mine within this same broad area that's carved out by these connections, uh, because I think this shows the wealth of resources waiting in STS to be discovered by intellectual historians. Uh, so my work, my current work, argues that the democratic populist public culture of the United States has exerted pressure on the disciplines in a slightly different way than that which is described in Ted's crossing numbers. I found uh, that it was surprisingly common in the late 19th and early 20th centuries for scientifically minded American scholars to view their work as an expression of democratic values in general and of American values in particular, uh, rather than as the result of bracketing such particularistic concerns. Uh, so, whereas Joel is emphasizing the material dimensions, the local character, and the pedagogical and disciplinary functions of knowledge making, I'm looking at these broader contexts of national politics uh, and academia as a whole. I'm looking across the American disciplines since the Civil War, uh, tracking these large tectonic shifts in epistemological discourses and in meta-level claims uh, about the relationship between epistemologies and political commitments in the civic, uh, civic sphere. So uh, to borrow a term from Sheila, I'm interested in how and why American scholars have tried, uh, although mostly failed, to change the naively objectivist uh, civic epistemology that has prevailed in the United States. So I fear I've actually uh, barely referred to Ted's talk here, uh, a response, I guess. Um, as we've all learned over the years, uh, he says so much, and he says it so well when he gives one of these talks that there's hardly anything left to do when he steps away from the podium. Uh, and here, as usual, I do find myself fundamentally in agreement with his thoughts. Looking toward the next 20 years, I hope that his generous vision of the relationship between history of science and STS prevails. Uh, Ted himself has certainly shown in his own work that these fields overlap seamlessly, uh, or perhaps uh, we might say they mesh or they merge, uh, even better, they're co-produced. Uh, Whatever the case, I, I plan to keep steering intellectual historians toward the fertile ground that Sheila, Ted, and the rest of you who have opened up. Uh, and who knows, maybe uh, even the philosophers themselves will see the light one of these days. Uh, at a gathering like this, we can and should think big. <laughs> Thanks to our speakers, we have about 15 minutes, I think, for um, questions and answers. Um, so uh, let me invite you, um, real and virtual, uh, to post your questions to Ted, Andy, um, and yourselves, if you wish. Um, so uh, who would like to open up the floor? Hi everyone, I'm Dorothy Zinberg. I'm on the faculty at the Kennedy School. I originally come out of biochemistry and have been working on issues related to science, technology, and public policy forever. I just wanted to, I like your use of the word vernacular, and I wanted to introduce vernacular right at the beginning and say, as he was speaking, I had perfect parentheses for the discussion which was in the 1960s, I remember reading an article in the Washington Post which said that a certain dinner party in Washington had extraordinary cachet because the host and hostess had managed to <coughs> snag a physics student as the guest of honor. And all interest and knowledge was then directed to the physics student. Last night I heard Brian Williams, who is the head of the CBS at CBS News, begin the program, the first thing, 7 o'clock. Should we believe all these doctors and scientists 
who tell us there is no danger from radiation. And I thought that very neatly shows a total shift in attitudes and values about the role of the scientist. Did you want to tie that back to the vernacular? And that, my vocabulary was the vernacular. <laughs> Did you want to comment on that broad shift that Dorothy was talking about? From lionizing the physicist and the GC cocktail party to disbelieving comments like reassuring observations about radiation? <laughs> so, what I want to introduce. Him. Oh, sorry, Clark Miller from Arizona State University. Um, I want to ask both of you, uh, given the importance that you've identified uh, of this shared intellectual space for both understanding the modern condition uh, in a more robust way uh, and also informing scholarship uh, ideally on both sides. Whether you think either of those uh, statements has any implication for how we should organize intellectual activity within the academy. Uh, does, it, does it matter in any way, shape, or form whether we continue to operate in sociology, history, philosophy departments, uh, either for our ability to talk to each other uh, or to the outside world, or do we need new forms of intellectual organization within the academy? Well, I'll, um, I'll I have the impression that um, maybe this is how it looks at UCLA, that, uh, uh, is that uh, you know, physicians are always in departments, uh, many, uh, usually in departments, and a lot of money for uh, speakers and conferences uh, is still interdisciplinary. And uh, in, in, in that, so that, that the, um, the uh, you know, these cross-cutting lines uh, going, you know, going, uh, running through the disciplines are, um, you know, frequently being uh, frequently being formed, but they um, and uh, and in the con I mean, it isn't discussions like that that I really enjoy myself. So I, and I, you know, get you know new stimulation on the things that I thought I understood, so that I never really get beyond this. I, every time I'm going to leave this miserable domain of numbers and statistics, <laughs> I encounter somewhere something somebody else has done some, done doing something that I never thought of that is too interesting to. Alone, and so I'm back, I'm back to it. So it actually keeps me narrow by, in one sense, by you know, by allowing that narrowness to be wider in others. And um, you know, well, so that you know, in some ways, the question for a field like this is: to what extent does that need to move on to, you know, to uh, uh, you know, disciplines, to, to you know, to uh, you know, things, centers, or even departments that can hold positions. And um, yeah, I like to somehow, I would like somehow to have the positions and to maintain a bit of the. Uh, of the um, you know unexpected uh, cross fertilization, uh, I would not like science studies to become a little a little walled enclave, um, or even a big walled enclave. I, I don't think there's really any danger of that, but uh, I do really celebrate the, you know, that uh, people working on, in some sense, on the same thing but from very different perspectives to learn from each other without giving up all the you know, the differences. That their their educational and sort of disciplinary background has raised. Supposing a history department chair sitting in this room had heard Andy talk and said, since the most interesting intellectual history is being done in fields like sociology and even ethnography of Russian nuclear scientists, uh, we have pretty scarce positions. Nobody's actually doing Byzantine history in sociology or some other places. Um, therefore, let's take our scarce position and give it to some place that looks clearly historical and clearly ancient and in the past and done with, and let the anthropologists, the sociologists, etc., do the intellectual history, which they seem well capable of. Then, uh, well, you might say it's nice that people talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And it's not really a lost position if you have somebody who's uh, interacting with other fields. Yeah. But, uh, but don't look, I would not say a word against Byzantine history. <laughs> <laughs> it also has its own in, in, in interaction. And, you know, and uh, is a model for all of us. I mean, being Byzantine. <laughs> <laughs> I think my own solution would probably run up against not only the constraints of money, but also the constraints of time. I'd probably take uh, several hours added to the day. But uh, I, mean, I think it would be interesting, to sort of extrapolating out some of the trends that have been taking place recently. It, you know, I can imagine a university in which everyone was simultaneously located in some kind of vaguely methodologically defined discipline, but also one or more object fields that are interdisciplinary at the same time, so that the university is kind of a big mesh on these different dimensions. Uh, that would take up uh, an enormous amount of time, but I think it would be interesting and fun. Uh, the question of whether uh, intellectual history is in history is one I think about quite a bit, um, that ideally in, in my sort of utopian future that I'm imagining people would try to be uh, a little more respectful across the differences and a little less combative, but uh, given financial resources, that's a lot to ask. You know, I come from a, uh, just, it's not intellectual history, history of science often is in different departments as it is, as it is here. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, in some way, the, the being in uh, a history of science department perhaps does or could facilitate um, closer ties to, uh, you know, to science studies, let's say, to philosophy of science or sociology of science or all the, all, all the, you know, the, the science studies. but. Um, um, and, but cuts off, or not, doesn't cut off, but it, it diminishes another kind of interaction. I personally am happy to have my position in a, in a history department, but you know, and, and you said it exactly right. History doesn't, doesn't demand, you know, we tolerate uh, and uh, don't, don't, often don't demand very close, very intense interactions. But there's, and it's like, and art history is rarely in history, but historians like art, and uh, <laughs> history of science often is in history, but historians don't like it. They just don't like science. <laughs> not because they don't disapprove of what we're doing, and they just they're there because they never like science. <laughs> I guess the I guess the other piece of the question, though, is that departments are not just about the intellectual life of scholars and how it's organized geographically. They're also about uh, they're also the way in which economic resources, particularly for student education, are parceled out, both undergraduate and graduate student education within the university. So if you have any thoughts about the, the implications for for students as well, that would be useful. Oh, so we'll be coming back to it's exactly that question uh, throughout the meeting, especially on Saturday. I'll take that as an interesting <laughs> comment for the moment. And, uh, <laughs> well, in that case, Thomas, having just freed up the mic for that audience at the time, I think it's time for you. One more question or comment. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Jones. I'm a fellow in the SDS program at Harvard and also at the Center for the Environment. And I'm curious, at this question of disciplines and connections, and we've identified a lot of fertile ground, You've also brought a historical approach to bear on it, and I'm curious if you have any reflections looking at the history of the disciplines over the last, say, 20, 30 years as STS has come in and as the relationships between STS programs and history of science or even insights from intellectual history within history departments. Are we moving in a way that's more conducive to this type of engagement from a sort of very um, from a very institutional ground, or are we moving in other directions? What are some of the major historical things you've seen going on lately that might structure what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of decades? I defer to someone with a longer baseline experience than I have. What do you mean, we? <laughs> <laughs> you mean, you mean the, the thinking, especially of, of, of science studies or SDS? Yeah. Or, or those interested in this type of I mean, interdisciplinary no. or different types of. I mean, here's, here's what. Development. I don't know about, you know, on the. Um, I think this is kind of standard wisdom, but I'm not really the master of it. In some way, the, you know, in the sciences, the disciplines reach the peak of. Uh, 
of, uh, of countries on you know, strength in the, or early in the 20th century and then started forming interdisciplines. <clears throat> and uh, in some ways that has happened less on the social and humanistic side of the academy. And yet uh, I, I see you know, our field, but it's the SDS or it's the science field, you know, full of issues that have drawn attention and, and attracted, attracted interest. Uh, you know, uh, across the wide range of social and some humanistic fields. Uh, and, um, are there boundaries that you think are especially resistant, I mean, apart from, I mean, leaving aside the question of history in particular, but are there places in the UCLA experience where you find the conversations harder than you would have imagined? No, I would. Just, I mean, there are um, there are uh, arrival and stronger, um, you know, uh, magnets. I would say the, you know, the one the, 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 the economic, the sort of rational choice kind of understanding, and the other end, the brain, um, which uh, you know, don't give much credence to the way we have learned to think about. It. Maybe maybe we're just as culpable and not and often not giving much credence to them, but I can't help seeing who I am and I'm like <laughs> reprehensible. Uh, you know, inside a job or something inspired me to maintain them. And Andy, you mentioned um, at least one thing that when you started doing your dissertation research you didn't find within history certain kinds of sophisticated treatments. But would you say that I mean, even from your sh relatively short vantage point? Most people writing dissertations and then being assistant professors think that that's a pretty infinite time horizon. So in that period, have you found things shifting? Yeah, I think there's a, a good bit more interest. I think, uh, you know, in the, in the particular sort of subfield that I'm talking about, I think this stuff is really just starting to happen over the past five years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struck in, in, in listening to what Ted said about the, uh, the intermingling of disciplines, or the creation of hybrid disciplines in the sciences, something like physical chemistry, and how we don't have that in the humanities and the social sciences. But I think what happens there is that the disciplines just stay as they are, and individuals get uh, less disciplined, exactly, but they get disciplined and then they start expanding beyond themselves as they find uh, in their particular object areas of study that there are all of these other kinds of resources. I think there's uh, you know, uh, much less, much more uh, positive feedback for those who are interdisciplinary. Obviously, we talk about it all the time, right? And no one would uh, be terribly respectful, I think, of a scholar who just learned only what was in their field and nothing else. There are some disciplines that are powerful enough to pull that off. <coughs> to be a good example. Uh, but I think mostly the, the emphasis on interdisciplinarity is, is quite strong and, and fairly universal. But it's, considered a good thing to be able to go to adjacent fields and to mobilize theoretical resources and concepts and that sort of thing. All that said, it's an, an enormous amount of pressure on individuals because it just adds to the workload that one needs to do. Uh, one thing, I, I, can I just pose the question and not try to answer it, but there are, besides the, the disciplines, there are all these, there are all these newish fields whose last word is studies. <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, which again, I, uh, I'm gonna, it's, since we're running out of time, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, there were areas going way back, and they are the, um, the sort of CIA uh, funding for those. Um, I think isn't so important anymore. But, but, but then, you know, women's studies and gender, you know, gender studies and you know, African American studies and uh, um, American Indian studies and you know, we have all of them usually twice in, the, in, a, in a giant public university, um, but, and, but there they are, and you know, and they are they've been uh, the the center of a real intellectual activity without fully gaining the legitimacy that they would like. But, but it's, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. But SDS is not. It doesn't have the, it, most of those are, are associated with a, uh, some some kind of identity politics, and I don't think that's really what SDS is about. So, uh, just as, as, you know, if that is a strong uh, you know uh, uh, enterprise that in some ways cuts across the, the disciplines. Um, 
there are closer parallels, maybe in religious studies and American studies, more like that. So just one uh, quick last question. One of the reasons that the sciences uh, have this kind of system crossing mechanism is that um, is instruments in some new way of looking at things, often a very expensive new way of looking at things emerges and then it creates its own communities and the brain which you mentioned that is obviously very closely linked to <coughs> imaging technologies. So in the humanities and social sciences, um, can you think of analogs? You talk about identity politics as being our analog of MRI, perhaps, but can you think of anything else? I mean, the large data set is there. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the whole, I mean, you know, modeling techniques and statistical techniques, yeah. but that's the quantitative techniques would be. But for quality, would be, well, you know, you know, I don't know, well, you know, everybody can talk about the code now. <laughs> well, I would have been, it just shows something. I remember this was a while ago, but I remember somebody mentioning a conference on Foucault and a statistician said, yeah, Which one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the pendulum could be the pendulum, from it, and, and there's a, you know, Foucault's pendulum to uh, the bridge to Kappa, as it were. But, you know, I mean, that's say there is a, a, a certain, you know, a, a larger or narrower, you know, body of, uh, body of theory, sometimes called postmodern, you know, have shown. You know, it doesn't unite us, but we might fight about it, but we all know it now. Uh, or maybe, maybe not exactly the same part. And that is a, uh, you know, a force for, you know, for, 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 if not unity, for dialogue. And do you have anything to add to that? <coughs> well, I think the very identity concerns themselves uh, really do cut across the disciplines in a lot of ways. People are very comfortable with even mobilizing those categories in a lot of different contexts. It's not entirely unrelated to the, the body of theory. Uh, but I do think there's you know, a fair amount of traffic along those lines as well. Well, end this session with a very quick anecdote, which is that um, a couple of years ago, I was at the first faculty, the open faculty meeting of the Kennedy School, and sat down somewhere towards the back of the room, and under the chair in front of me, uh, there was a work of Foucault, and, and I thought to myself, hey, the Kennedy School has actually hired somebody who comes to the first faculty meeting and who reads Foucault. And then we went around the room introducing ourselves or something of the new people. Uh, and he had been hired to teach writing. So we sat with the speakers a hand and then moved on.